great. Uh, so as I said, welcome to the Perspectives on Youth. Uh, Perspectives on Youth is a series of the youth partnership uh, where we cover different topics that are upcoming uh, in the youth sector and that uh, we have an opportunity and chance to explore uh, through shorter articles, webinars, discussions, uh, podcasts, uh, and also visual elements. Uh, today we will be speaking about digital youth work, uh, but before we start, I would uh, give a floor to uh, the new coordinator, new manager of the youth partnership, Clotilde Talot, to quickly introduce uh, the series and welcome everybody uh, before moving on to our facilitators. Thank you very much, uh, Lana, and good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to this uh, first webinar on of the Perspective on Youth series uh, organized by the European Union and Council of Europe Youth Partnership. Um, so the partnership, uh, for those who, who don't know very well, this uh, uh, this program uh, is a platform for cooperation in the field of youth, and uh, it also has a function of a, a think tank, uh, gathering uh, and producing knowledge and translates it for an effective use in youth policy and, and practice. Perspectives in Youth uh, is a key activity of the partnership, seeking for trends uh, in the new in the youth field that need. Uh, innovative and uh, forward-looking answers, stimulating uh, debates and discussions on issues that need to be considered uh, by youth policies uh, in Europe. So this morning, uh, digital uh, youth work uh, that aimed at launching this, the series, as Lana said, and the conversation with uh, youth workers, researchers, and youth activists on these important is issues uh, in the context of the pandemic, but also uh, beyond. And I would like to warmly thank uh, the speakers uh, of this first uh, webinar. It's great to benefit from your uh, complementary expertise and experience on digitalization and youth work. And I would like also to thank Lana, Alexandra and Martina for uh, the fantastic work they have done uh, when preparing this, uh, this webinar. I hope this webinar will be a learning experience for uh, all of us, uh, an inspiration, and will provide you with food for thought uh, in your daily work when working with and for uh, young people. Uh, I wish you uh, a fruitful uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Clotilde. And indeed, uh, this topic of digital youth, youth work uh, now is uh, quite important uh, within the sector and something that uh, that we are taking forward uh, since the last uh, youth work convention. Uh, I will briefly just uh, mention what the series is about. Uh, so. Uh, the perspectives on youth, as Clotilde introduced it, is looking towards the future and looking uh, ahead in the youth field. But we also cover this series from the different uh, from the different topics. Uh, so we have covered, and you can see on the page uh, of the youth partnerships on perspectives of youth. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. I saw that uh, there was a bit of a trouble with uh, screen sharing but hopefully now you can you can see my screen uh, so the perspectives of youth covers different topics and uh, last year we introduced kind of four main themes which are political participation of young people social inclusion digitalization and artificial intelligence climate change sustainability as well as social values and social rights uh, of young people uh, this webinar on digital youth work is uh, clearly within the social inclusion, digitalization, and AI group, but we will also be expanding this section uh, throughout the year to include specific topics and uh, having the specific focus also on youth work, uh, but then also on uh, other themes uh, and uh, topics that are coming up. So I stop sharing now, and uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce two of the facilitators of this webinar. Alexandra and uh, Martina, and they will be taking uh, taking forward this conversation uh, and then also introducing you to the speakers. Uh, we also shared the article which was written uh, as a kind of uh, food for thought uh, ahead of this webinar. So we will hear a little bit about that and we also look forward to hearing the views from the audience both on Zoom and on Facebook regarding the future of uh, digital youth work. So I hand over to Alexandra. 
Thank you, Lana. It is such a pleasure uh, to be with all of you uh, this morning uh, for, for this webinar in which we will uh, deal with this uh, very, very important topic of, of digital youth work. And uh, for the beginning, we would like to introduce uh, the guest speakers that we have with us uh, today. We would like to thank you all also for being available to be with us this uh, morning. Uh, so uh, this uh, morning with us. We will have four uh, guest speakers um, and uh, we will just briefly introduce them now. So uh, with us we will have uh, Michele Di Paola, uh, the author of the article that Lana just mentioned and he's a youth worker and trainer, expert in digital youth work and uh, digital media literacy projects both in Italy with his organization Spaccia Giovani and in Europe. And we also have with us Dr. Alicia Pavlovchuk, um, an expert um, in youth digital inclusion research and practice. She currently works as an ICDD um, research fellow at the United Nations University, and her research focuses um, on girls' digital uh, inclusion in formal educational efforts globally and their evaluation. And the next guest speaker we have with us this morning is Juha Kiviniemi, a planning officer in Verke, the Finnish Center for Expertise on Digital Youth Work. There he works on international activities and maker culture, among other things. He especially enjoys hosting training sessions and has a soft spot for youth participation. And finally, we also have seen Elul to, with us today. Um, he's a young activist, a member of the Advisory Council of Youth on Youth of um, the Council of Europe. Um, he's the coordinator on visibility communications and outreach of the Joint Council on Youth. And his background comes and his experience from the youth sector comes from the National Youth Council of Malta. So thank you once again for being with us this morning and we're really looking forward to hearing all of your uh, perspectives on, on the topic of digital youth work. Uh, but to start off, uh, we would like uh, to invite uh, Michele uh, to shortly introduce to us uh, the article um, that uh, he has written for the perspectives on, on youth and in which he uh, poses many questions, uh, mainly around uh, whether we uh, need need uh, digital and smart uh, youth work strategies. Uh, and so uh, for that, we would like to give the floor to Michele to present us uh, his article. Yes, thank you, Alexandra, and thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting me and for uh, allowing me to, to write and publish this article, which is a way to share um, a bit of experience and a bit of uh, reflection that I've been doing together with quite some other people all over Europe uh, in the last few years about this topic and of course especially this last year going deep in, um, in this topic. It, it was more or less one year ago when me and Juha which is here today and other colleagues from VN Extra organized the first uh, online seminar to support uh, youth workers facing the then uh, new crisis of uh, moving everything online as the new pandemic was forcing every in-presence activity to, to close. And one year later, here we are, I guess we all learned a lot during this year. And uh, also we made a lot of mistakes, which is a good way to learn anything, by the way. Uh, and so, this is uh, what I'm going to share now. It's, uh, of course, uh, part of this experience uh, during this year as well. So I'm sharing my screen and let's see if I can make it. I should, I mean, <laughs> so some honest truth for uh, as a starting point. So in the article, which I'm going to summarize now, uh, we start from these little points, which I was calling precondition. Uh, we'll, we need to know wh wh where is the starting point. Mm -hmm. um, and the starting point is this one. We are not, or almost not part, we as a youth sector, education, youth work, are in any way underrepresented among the stakeholders uh, in the conversation about digitalization. Very often, uh, there's no voice from the educational world, from the youth work world, uh, in this kind of conversation. And, and that's, of course, uh, something we should try to, to fix. 
Uh, and then again, uh, we should ask ourselves, what is the internet like nowadays? There's a lot more to be aware of, especially regarding the last form of the internet, the, the internet of the platforms and the apps, so the very last uh, way to use the internet that young people are, but not only young people, are experiencing lately. So as I said, we did what we could during this one year of pandemic. It was a chance for learning. It was a chance for testing our boundaries and hopefully trying to reach out sometimes. Uh, we learned a lot, for sure. And, 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 and then is the point to ask ourselves, now what? So we tr should try to establish a strategy after this year to further develop uh, the concept of digital youth work and try to take advantage take advantage um, of what we faced and learned uh, during this very very long and incredible year and more than one year now so uh, here's my modest proposal <laughs> let's say like this um, a few elements a few items to well create an account this is but um, uh, a few items to, to, to deal with and a few steps to uh, reach a possible strategy towards uh, digital youth work. So the first point is it's my bad. I, I had only two points in the presentation, so don't consider it. Uh, let's start from here. Try not youth workers. We need, we need to put energy on this topic, this is actually what I was working about in the last years, but we need to go further here. Training youth workers should be our first starting point. And then, of course, we need to widen the access to devices and connectivity. Many, many initiatives are being proposed on this topic, from uh, advancing the right to repair uh, the devices, to granting internet as a basic human right, Some, someone is advocating for this, or anyway, pushing for one head, one access, we need to widen the access in order to properly do digital youth work. But then again, we need the recognition of youth work because we're talking about quality standard, we're talking about innovation policies, we're talking about spaces for advocacy of digital youth work and, and digital rights, but this cannot simply cannot happen without recognition of youth work being uh, general and being on the same level. Uh, we recently had the European Youth Work Convention and we, we discussed a lot about this topic. So I think it's worth to underline it again here. And then the topic of digital divide. So tackling the digital inclusion problem and trying to, from one side, create activities which are inclusive by design, but from the other side to overcome the digital divide, meaning uh, the difficulties of people living in rural areas, for instance, uh, to access proper uh, quality connections or uh, the problem of simply having uh, devices to be used uh, in new centers or in new services or any way to support youth work being done digitally. And then again, developing our own tools. Uh, I guess this is a bit of a provocative proposal, but uh, it's not so strange if you look look back what, what happened uh, in the last few years. Uh, there was a lot of tools developed as card games, board games in, in youth work. And, and the point that uh, digital tools, which can be available nowadays are not meant for youth work. I guess after this year, it's it's common sense. Uh, so maybe it's time also to, to start developing something of our own, uh, designed and created, keeping in mind uh, the needs of non-formal education activities and so on. After one year, some attempts of having platforms more connected to this kind of uh, format is, is happening. Uh, I don't want to do any advertisement here, but a few more uh, uh, attentive platforms, attentive to, to the group dimension, the possibility to move from one place to another as you would do in a live training session setting or something are slowly appearing. But of course, we, we can do more and we can develop more. So probably it's time to think about it. And also in order to think about this, but this probably should have 
come in the first place. Uh, we need a conversation about funding and investment for, for digital youth work. Uh, in a certain moment, uh, someone thought that uh, online is, is faster and cheaper, which is also true, but not only like that. Uh, it's not only that online is faster and cheaper. There's a lot of issues there, presentations, uh, tools, uh, uh, knowing what to do and how to do it properly. So yeah, uh, a, a proper conversation about funding should be taken into account. So these are six elements that should become the core of a possible strategy. Let me go back through all of them. Training of youth workers, improving the access to devices and connectivity, recognition of youth work, tackling digital inclusion, developing our own tools and define proper funding and investment for this kind of activities. And now, just to conclude and leave space for questions and discussions, how to, how to reach there, how, how to go there. Mm. Uh, so not why choose Hyman Work Club, sorry again. Mm. We need these three elements. We need, oops, no, oh, that's bad. Sorry, something wrong happened with the slide. So I will tell you without showing a, a wrong slide and that's bad. Um, I was saying three elements which we need to, to, to use to get there are the fact of working together in a cross-sectorial approach. So for instance, education, school, non-formal, youth work together, but also maybe uh, including the world of uh, technology and the tech sector. And the second way to reach there, it's a process of involvement of young people in co-designing activities, tools, instruments of digital youth work. And this could be mm, mutually beneficial could be a learning experience for young people and could be a very interesting way to do youth work for the educational and the youth work um, system in having the protagonists of their uh, and and to give sorry the protagonism of, of their activities to to youngsters and the last but but not least of course is that uh, if youth workers are involved and youngsters are involved, this is a new space for activities to create other kind of activities that we always wanted to develop further in the, let's say, uh, normal, <laughs> uh, but what's normal today, um, youth work world. And now we have the possibility to do it in a, in a different way. We can put youth workers and youngsters together, young people together in spaces where everybody can give a contribution on their own level. Youngsters can help youth workers to improve their skills, for instance, or to uh, use better uh, platforms and better tools to achieve better results online. And youth workers can help youngsters who question, for instance, the tool more to understand more the risk and the problem behind. So these are the three steps to reach there to try to achieve the six elements that I underlined before that could be a modest proposal again for a strategy to improve digital youth work after what we experienced during this year. But now I really want to stop here and to uh, open up a discussion about this. So yeah, let's try to listen to some question and, uh, um, and try to give some answer. And sorry again for that last slide, which I don't know why went lost. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michele, uh, for, for this presentation. And uh, we, of course, very much invite you to read uh, the full article uh, that, that is available on Perspectives and News and also on the, the Facebook events. Um, and uh, so now to, to kind of continue where you left off and you have tackled upon so many uh, important aspects, you know, from, from tools, inclusion, funding, uh, many things that we need to take into account in, in this discussion. And and so to, to kick off the discussion with um, our guest speakers uh, this morning, um, I would like to start off with a question for Yuha. 
So you have um, in his article and also now in, in his presentation, uh, Michele raises this question of uh, whether we need to develop a digital and smart uh, youth work strategy. Now, Verke uh, has been a part of the expert group on risks, opportunities and implications of digitalization for youth, youth work and youth policy. And together with partners, you have also developed guidelines on digital youth work. So what are your views on this idea of a strategy? And uh, is this something that we need? Do we need a strategy and quality standards? And who do you think should be responsible to develop them? That's a really good question. Uh, to, the very short answer is yes, definitely we need more strategic thinking on in regards to digital youth work. What we've seen over the years in Verke uh, is that often digital youth work practice happens in, in projects uh, and it happens by few talented individuals that are motivated in doing, doing that thing. And if they change jobs, then all that practice will disappear. Uh, but if there is a strategic approach to it, then there is a much more uh, or much higher chance of that practice actually becoming daily youth work practice, no matter who is the youth worker implementing the thing. Uh, so definitely it's needed. Another thing that clearly advocates the need for a uh, strategic approach on digital youth work is this current COVID pandemic. What we saw in Finland was that um, organizations that already had a strategy in place incorporating somehow digitalization, that they had really thought about how we, how we take a handle of uh, digitalization in general uh, within our youth work practice, they were much quicker to respond uh, when the pandemic hit and when everything uh, everything moved uh, into online services. And they've been a bit more agile also in incorporating uh, different kinds of digital youth work uh, into, into this whole COVID situation. So definitely there is a need. Um, when we come to where, who should be creating the strategy, I think Michele mentioned uh, you, uh, you were talking about tools or creating new tools, but I think this applies to strategies as well. We need to be able to create spaces where uh, different actors, different stakeholders can have a meaningful dialogue on their own level, which I think is the key about the strategies themselves. Um, I, I mentioned in my bio that I have a soft spot for um, youth participation, but I also have a lot of frustration uh, from the field of youth participation in the sense that often participation is, is kind of understood as everyone has to take part in everything. And I think that that's a bit unfair. If I was suddenly myself put in the position of drafting, let's say, European policy on this or that, I would be completely out of, out of my comfort zone. And this is true for young people if we put them suddenly in charge of creating organizational strategies on digital youth work. It makes no sense but they should be still included in the discussion on what they need and how that translates into the digital world. Practitioners need to be able to speak about how, how their practice is and what their practice needs in terms of how uh, Michele also mentioned uh, competences, uh, training for them, what kind of provisions they need in terms of digital devices or money or time and all of these things. And also the a kind of manager level of organizations, they need to be able to set the, the uh, guidelines or kind of framework on what we are operating in. It's easy for practitioners to say, oh, we need, we need brand new Macs and iPhones for everyone, for example, which isn't plausible for most youth organizations. So everyone kind of on the same level discussing, then we get to the discussion of uh, kind of what the strategy should include, like should there be quality standards for what is the minimum level of understanding on digitality, et cetera. And how do you create standards that translate into the next big technological thing that happens? That's the tricky part, but it's easier once you get everyone around the same table. Thank you, Juha. Let's see what uh, comes from the research point of view as well on the topic. I mean, that's also interesting to see, Alisa. You have some experience, extensive experience in digital inclusion community projects in design, facilitation, and evaluation. Um, and your research has included a number of policy making efforts and recommendations in the context of youth digital inclusion. 
what is your take on inclusion in digital youth work right now? Like, like what makes digital youth work more inclusive than regular uh, youth work on one hand, but in the same time, how does it exclude uh, some people from participating? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, interesting question. Um, I think it's uh, quite complex uh, in terms of, you know, um, just the way we define and think about digital inclusion, because it's such a responsive and dynamic process. And, you know, it can't be static. We can't just say that this is what digital inclusion is all about. Uh, but when it comes to digital youth work, I think uh, when we think about inclusion, we have to think both, uh, you know, uh, thinking about young people, but also about the youth workers themselves, who very often, you know, um, don't have the the digital skills that are needed for uh, for for the practice. Um, so in a sense, we can imagine it as a improvised performance between, you know, youth workers and young people. It's like an ongoing thing and it's changing and it's maybe a bit of a like a rave dance than, you know, like a like a like a uh, or, yeah, organized dance or whatever. So I think um, when we think about it and when we talk about it, we can see the youth workers and the young people. But we often forget about another actor like participating in this performance, which is the technology. And I think this is an important part to realize that uh, no matter what we do at this stage, we have this, um, you know, very important. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to say that as a partner, but an actor that kind of um, influences all of our interactions. And I think we need to acknowledge the limitations of uh, how the digital technologies and how uh, they uh, kind of serve our needs, both as youth workers and young people. So, um, so, so, like I said, it's a very, um, very dynamic process, which in a sense, uh, I think it's important to also say that when we think about meaningful digital inclusion, uh, we have to realize that we do like, you know, include young people into this digital sphere, but at the same time, we are uh, deepening the big data divide, which means that, you know, you are participating in the digital world, but you are producing data without full understanding what uh, this information is doing to you or affects your free will, your choices in life. So I think uh, when we talk about young, uh, youth workers training, uh, I think we should actually expect more from, uh, from the big tech companies and actually uh, think about the way they produce their tools. Uh, so it's not all on the youth workers, on young people to constantly train themselves, to improve themselves, because I think it's impossible to constantly be in that space where you you're constantly not good enough, essentially. So I think that's that's an important one. And um, the, the other part of the question that you mentioned, which is about, you know, is digital youth work more inclusive uh, than the traditional youth work? And I think, I think this is a very, again, a complex uh, area. You know, you can see just through COVID how digital youth work created these innovative safe spaces for uh, many young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. You can think about the digital youth work as a cross-cultural experience that, you know, um, people from all over the world can participate in it if they do have access to digital technologies. And there has been quite a lot of research around digital youth participation during COVID and some people perhaps overly roman romanticized the participation and said that this is the, the time when young people are going to smash the, the, the you know the the power you know the power dynamics all over there and kind of have their voices heard but at the same time we have to think about the young people who are even more excluded from the society by not having access uh, especially during the uh, pandemic you know so uh, just basic education um, access without not having reliable wi-fi or having to share the device with uh, other children um at, at home or young people at home you know that's that's the limitations uh, and finally, um, the, you know, thinking about the issues of digital youth work that also took place during the pandemic, you know, uh, there are um, things around uh, online violence uh, that uh, kind of leads to uh, people's self uh, digital exclusion. And this is a big one when it comes to the, the research that I do at the United Nations University around gender. So many girls have to kind of remove themselves from the online spaces to feel safe. Again, thinking about intersectional issues, so age, race, you know, your social class, all of these things affect um, affect your inclusion. But in the end, I would say you, we should expect more from the tech companies to make the space more inclusive uh, and based on human rights approach. Um, so that's 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 the answer.
Thank you very much, Alicia, and, and touching upon again so many so many important aspects of of this uh, this 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 topic. And and you you said that uh, there was this idea maybe romanticized that young people are gonna smash uh, you know the system and and participate more during COVID. And and this um, very nicely then brings us to 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 our next question uh, directed at Sean, um, where where we would like to 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 know you know from your perspective as a youth activist and, and someone who represents the voice and perspective of young people, um, how would you say that uh, digital youth work has shifted with the pandemic? And do young people participate more now uh, or did they actually participate more before the pandemic? Thank you very much for that brilliant question. And I also want to thank the Youth Partnership for curating this, this kind of space, because I think we're debating a really important topic over here, a topic that's really important to young people dealing with a disruptive change in the way that society and participation works. And speaking after such brilliant speakers, I have many different thoughts buzzing in my head, and I, I'm really tempted to jump on the impact of algorithms and big data and how generally the nature of society will be changing over the next few decades because of the impact of these exponentially changing technologies. Um, but I, I believe that that is in fact the point at the end of the day, that the nature of participation is changing. So even that, that question alone is a difficult one to ask, answer because there's so many different facets to the topic of, of digitalization whether it's data, whether it's the internet of platforms like Michaela mentioned earlier, whether it's how disruptive and, and how the data is impacting the way people participate and the way they communicate. So there's multiple overlapping issues that, that we're facing with this specific topic. How did digital youth work shift during the pandemic? I think that's quite clear that there was a mass adoption of digital tools in order to facilitate higher levels of participation, or let's say at least to make sure that participation keeps on going, that we can, like this webinar, for example, so that we can continue um, organizing our events and having interactions with each other. But I do believe that that is a consequence of the inherent value of technological tools, something we this moved upon due to the systematic risk that the pandemic uh, brought about. It wasn't a move that we took because we inherently knew the value that technological and digital tools can bring towards us. We were forced to use digital tools in order to keep the show going, to keep our events running. And I think that links very well to a point that, that you have mentioned earlier with regards to organizations in Finland, that organizations that were dealing and working with digital tools in advance and did have a strategy in place were much better equipped to just facilitate better levels of participation. And I do believe this is a consequence of us using technology and digital tools as a band-aid, as a safety stop towards making sure that things can keep on happening, but without us fully understanding the extent or potential or impact of these tools. So we started hosting live streams, we started hosting webinars, we started moving our tools digitally, but as a consequence of systematic risk that, we, that didn't allow us to work in any other way. And this has led us to know what I believe now in the present is a lot of young people are indeed participating less, I would say, because we're not really using these tools in an effective way. Now, a point I, I really liked from the article that, that Michaela published is how the in, in the future, how offline and online needs to work in tandem, how you can't just focus, they, they can't compete. You need to understand the value of both digital participation or digital tools and, and offline or physical tools and make sure they, they're compatible and they work in each other's favor. At the end of the day, digital tools bring very different kinds of, of practical and efficient kinds of benefits towards facilitating participation and having a dialogue that are different towards having a physical offline, offline meeting. And we need to learn how to balance those two. I think it's difficult for us to have a conversation today in 2021 because we're facing a global pandemic where the mental health of young people is severely impacted, where the nature of, of society and the way we dialogue with each other is even more strained and even more... Uh, in, in a way like push towards some weird macabre form that we're not exactly used to or, or, or comfortable with. However, moving forward post pandemic, I, I do hope that we maybe that we can talk about this later as well, because I'm going on a, tan a tangent, but I, I do believe that 
we we need to find a way to to find how we can balance these these um, the tools together, whether offline or online, to make sure we have a space that can use these technologies in our favor rather than against us. Because that is one I, I think one of the key talking points we need to focus on here, that these spaces allow us to, to brainstorm and ensure that, that we can use these technologies to benefit higher levels of participation and to benefit democratic dialogue rather than hindering the democratic process and feeding into digital divides and, and just generally weakening participation as well. Thank you, sorry, Aram. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sine. Michele, back to you now, like you heard all um, our colleagues, the different people that have read your article, listened to your presentation and actually commented back on it. Um, I'm going to touch upon one of the things that you said were the provocative ones no, in your in your article. Now, like the most ambitious point, let's say, in your strategy that you're proposing, those digital uh, platforms and tools designed specifically for the youth sector. I mean, you also said that um, this morning before. So our question is whether more platforms or tools are really necessary and how can we ensure that actually digital in digital youth work is a tool for de delivering quality youth work and not it does not become a purpose uh, in itself. Like sometimes we see that youth workers are a bit more concerned with the digital tools they're using instead of the content and the quality. So what is your view on this, like how we can deal with this? Yeah, thank you for the question because it's really something which I want to yeah to go deeper into. Uh, from one side, of course, I agree with you. You know, we shouldn't uh, think about digital tools just for the sake of creating something which is digital, and so it's good for that for that very reason. Uh, my starting point is something which was mentioned by, for instance, by Alicia before, uh, the internet nowadays, when I was talking about knowing how is the internet nowadays, and Sean mentioned the internet of platforms, the, the internet nowadays is, is based, at least part of it, on a mechanism that we don't see, which are exploiting uh, users' data continuously by purpose, by design. Uh, and as long as it's not forbidden, uh, it's also something that we have to deal with. And then from one side, of course, policymakers should do the part. And I agree with Alicia completely that also the platforms themselves should be a bit more, you know, involved on, 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 on this frontier. But on the other side, just for this simple starting reason, we should really consider creating something from our side. I would love to use tools which are not exploiting my participants data instead of using the one that we have which maybe they don't know but i know perfectly what's happening with the data of the people i bring there so uh, i feel uncomfortable as a youth worker as an educator to to ask people to use tools knowing that their personal data and behaviors online behaviors would be profiled and exploited by but that's the only chance we have nowadays so probably let's not make it the only chance could be a, a part of the solution, part of the way out. And I'm not thinking about super global, super big platforms because we don't have the strength and the, the money and the, and the expertise to build that yet. Uh, but tools, small tools, things that could be used during activities, things that could be offered to a group to achieve something together. Yeah, these could be at hand this could be, for instance, the outcomes of some, I don't know, key action to Erasmus Plus project uh, from, by some partnership. And it's about time that we start focus creating these kind of tools as we have been doing in the last year, as I mentioned, creating interesting board games or card games, which are not commercial product, but educational ones. Then it's not that being commercial is bad. You know, you can also sell your tools and get some money out of them. It's fine. But the point is, what happens to the data of the users? That would be the first concern. That would be my first reason why we should start considering creating something ourselves. 
Thank you very much, Michele, and and all the guest speakers for your very interesting uh, inputs. And we would actually now like to open the floor for questions from the audience. So those of you that are with us on Zoom, you can write your questions on the chat. And those that are following us on Facebook Live, you can write the questions in comments. And uh, we will then try to incorporate them here in the conversation with our guest speakers. You can also address them to a guest speaker in specific or or just a general question uh, to whomever uh, feels like they would like to answer. So uh, if any of you have any questions uh, you would like to uh, ask our guests, uh, please just write them on the chat or um, in the comments on Facebook. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I would actually uh, like to, to, to launch a question that is kind of for all of you <laughs> uh, and, and, and that is related to, to kind of this, you know, future of digital youth work, Post pandemic, as we are kind of hopefully slowly entering this idea that you know that there will be a post pandemic time, and you have you have touched upon um, Sean in your in your comment, but also related to to the Michele's article about this how we should you know combine the offline and online and that we should work together and that they should not be kind of, you know, we should not be competing there. Um, so how do, how do you see the future of digital youth work um, after the pandemic or in this post pandemic period? Um, this is a question to, to all of you. So if uh, anyone would like to, to answer, please uh, feel free. Was going to pick up this <laughs> but i can start so i would maybe break the ice and for sure someone else will follow um it was mentioned already that this year has been an, more than a year has been an extraordinary experience but then we kind of think that things will go on as it as they were during this year mm. on the other side we cannot think that things will be back at before this year uh, something new should come out uh, and this something new is the form I think and I expect digital youth work to become so something that is able to work together with traditional youth work and it would be very interesting to start building bridges between the two different approaches uh, uh, Yuha is an expert of uh, makers culture and so making people create with their hands actual devices that they can be used in a digital way. That could be one way, and it's a way that I love and I'm very interested in, by the way. But many others ways could happen. For instance, there will be no uh, need for uh, preparation tasks to be done in presence, moving people just to go visit a venue to decide where to do activities. This could be a simple online meeting and also groups could be put in touch among them before actually meeting, for instance, in a youth exchange so that you can start to know each other better. Then when, when you get there, you fully uh, take advantage of the experience because you already kind of know you, uh, each other and can get directly to the point. And these are just small hints and ideas that we are starting to understand about. But I guess more, more should come and more would come from the creativity and fantasy of, of youth workers. I think it's super interesting that you kind of touched on the last point you made in your comment. Uh, you first talked about technology, like maker activities and online technology and blah, blah. And then you touched on the point of once you get there, you already know the people. And this is kind of the youth work essence. That, that's what we are trying to achieve. I think one of the most important things moving forward from the pandemic is to kind of reassess and assess and evaluate, like, what did we actually learn from all this? And I'm hoping, I have the tiniest bit of hope already that uh, we would actually learn to better distill the essence of youth work um, so that we don't actually talk about whether it's an online technology or whether it's a robot that we're building or whether it's using a platform like WhatsApp to communicate with young people. But we would look at them look at what we do just as we look at a pool table or whatever facilities we build around the uh, kind of thing that we do as youth work. So kind of how do we understand uh, better what we are actually doing and achieving? Mm -hmm. Anissa, I see you want to say something on that. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. So um, this question of the future of digital youth work has been uh, kind of around in my research for a number of years now. So in 2008, in 2018, I um, spoke to um, youth workers in Scotland about the future of digital youth work. And then again, last year, I ran a workshop uh, when we were kind of just mapping ideas about uh, what digital youth work would look like in 2019. And it was really interesting because of some of the themes that I discovered in 2018 were around, you know, um, AI and how AI will essentially um, kind of replace the idea of youth work. And the same fear was present now when I ran the workshop last year. Uh, so then there was uh, um, examples of, you know, um, youth counseling uh, apps that support young people's mental health and how these are kind of being implemented into young, young people's life. Uh, and one of the issue that uh, the youth workers uh, mentioned was, you know, uh, the budget cuts. If there is no funding, it's essentially easier to create a bot or to replace uh, certain um, certain you know areas of employment with uh, with digital technologies. But then there was also a little bit of hope, you know. So that's good. Uh, then there was hope that things actually will get better in digital youth work because there will be more data available uh, in terms of what works and what doesn't work. There was. Also also hope that one day this data will actually become available uh, and we will be able to kind of uh, learn from it. Uh, so yeah, there was positives and negatives. Uh, and the final point, if I just may, is that um, there was quite emphasis on the fact that it no longer will be called digital youth work. It will be something else. It will just be um, something, but it won't be called digital youth work. what about you yeah i was about to jump in in fact i was really enjoying i, I really like the last point you made to be honest alicia with regards to there would be a new term for it it's because i again these these are, are tools that are, are changing the way our society works they're changing the the nature of, of interactions between different people and singling them out as, as something different than than just general interaction between different human beings is a mistake um and to to point out i i started to, studying digitalization through the lens of, of risk management in my master's. So I, I took it from the perspective of what risks do these technologies have on the status quo? What risks do they have for the public sector and the private sector? And one recurring point that we always come to, whether in our debates as young people in the advisory council or, or in, in spaces like this, is that the public sector has been slow in, in reacting to the development of these tools and, and recognizing the impact that they could have. That is scary in, in the perspective of regulation. So if we're talking about data, for example, there are competencies that we have not yet developed to be able to be ready for, for the potential impact that, that uh, big data, for example, and its, its usages can have on, on the democratic process, general participation and the like. The youth sector is, is one of those areas in which we can start building multipliers towards raising more awareness on these points because the people we work with are key users of these social platforms, they're key users of these tools, and they're the generation that is that are being birthed into using these technologies on a day-to-day -day basis. So you do not have the barrier over there with regards to them being aware of how these technologies would work. And I think this area is one of the best areas to involve young people when it comes to co-designing a, a strategy or, or tools or methodologies towards using these tools in our favor. We have a, a thing that we say in the advisory council, which is nothing about us without us. And I think that really applies over here because we're also experts in this regard once we use these technologies every day. Uh, so I believe cross-sectoral planning and making sure that young people are involved, but also the tech companies and, and as many different facets of society are involved is fundamental because the nature of participation is changing and it will keep on exponentially changing year by year. It's very hard to keep up with how these platforms are developing, but the truth is there that Michaela before said that they exploit our data by design. And the truth is we've never had such effective forms of decentralized information and that level of accessibility and never had such effective forms of communication. We're all in different countries at the moment, but here we are having a conversation right in our, in our households or offices connected as if we're in the same room. And the majority of the people in this, this call are older than Google, which is impressive to me because it's become such an integral part of our day-to-day -day life. And it 
I, I beg to question as a young person, what will our societies look like in 2050, in 2080, when I will be an, an elderly person and, and um, sitting on the couch and wondering what the hell these new technologies are and how they're impacting our day to day lives. So as a young people, as a young person, I do believe I need to flag the or raise the alarms or just panic a little bit because I do feel our, our the public sector needs to build more competences and, and be a bit aware of the potential existential threats that these technologies could pose for uh, our social norms. And let's not forget that the Internet of Platforms is just one facet of both digital tools. You have technologies like blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies that could change the very status quo of the economic sector as a whole. You have artificial intelligence that could exponentially impact and change the way it impacts society. So we need to think about these and the fact that we're having this conversation as a young person makes me extremely excited because at, at least we're we're opening the doors and starting the debates and I, I think that's one of the, pe the the benefits coming out of the pandemic that we've started recognizing the the value of these tools and we've been forced to use them to recognize them and to depend on them I in, in a way that at least going out of it will make us recognize that we need more of these conversations we need to take these technologies seri seriously because they have both a benefit, like this call, but they also pose a threat. And to be able to balance both, we need to, to understand them and we need to ensure that they work in our favor rather than against us. Thank you, Sin. We also very much believe that, you know, like nothing for youth without youth. So thank you very much for bringing this uh, perspective and underlining it with such a passionate uh, also, you know, like uh, approach. I really appreciate it. Um, we have a question in the chat from Ufuk Bal and, you know, like talking about young people and uh, how they can be included. Like, can we talk about all young people, like especially vulnerable um, uh, youth, uh, youth? I mean, how do we have any tips that we can give on how these people can be more, um, these young people can be more included uh, through the digital uh, youth work um, spectrum let's say maybe alisa you have some ideas or somebody else that would like to share with uh, our audience yeah i'm happy to start but i don't think i have um you know i used to do quite a lot of digital youth work on the ground and now i have become a researcher and i'm just like thinking about all the philosophical questions but i'm still trying to be kind of linked into the communities and kind of run different workshops so from my experience uh at present, I think uh, sometimes it might be actually useful to ask, is the digital youth work the right approach in certain places, you know? Is this, uh, should we be starting with digital youth work or is it, um, you know, um, starting with uh, young people's needs, with ma mapping their needs in the first place? Um, so I think there has been, um, in, in my work, uh, especially around gender digital inclusion, I've seen um, quite a lot of emphasis on ensuring that you, we don't jump in into digital solutions uh, without actually understanding their needs first. Um, so, but again, uh, when we do want to digital, we'll use digital technologies, and this is what I've noticed in Scotland, um, it is about obviously, you know, providing the devices, providing the reliable Wi-Fi, uh, you know, um, finding the spaces that are safe because, um, and there, there, there are a few exceptions, I think, where you can communicate safely and uh, ensure that young people are, um, they're, 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 they're anonymized. But um, I think I will leave it to the rest to give you practical tools on how this can be achieved. Michele, you want to say something? Oh, yeah, I can gladly add something. I mean, uh, what Alicia said stands as, as a starting point for sure. And then uh, depending on the target group, you can use uh, different strategies and different approaches. So the first hint would be uh, you really know uh, your target group and their needs so that you tailor uh, make a solution just for them. Uh, for instance, I've been uh, reflecting on this topic uh, together with other people on some kind of target groups. Uh, one of the things that came out and was a kind of a ha ha moment for us because you know you tend not to 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 think about this is that, for instance, talking about uh, visually impaired people online, everything is mostly visual. If you have problem with this, you are automatically cut out by the, the, the 80% of the possibilities of doing anything online, unless 
unless of course you use some technologies to help you and this is one side but on the other side unless you design the activities in a way that maybe the accent is moved away from this so big uh, element of uh, being visual and try to use other senses or other ways to uh, to include people uh, in what you're doing this is a very small example but it opened up a world uh, but then we started questioning all all we were doing online and uh, the very use of some practices and some platforms and yeah this thing of using uh, uh, video calls as the only space that you can uh, actually mean when you think about digital youth work there are a lot of other possibilities and in some situation in some context you you find out that probably the best way to approach someone is a phone call uh, which is nothing digital and nothing fancy but is super effective anyway so again let's start to understand who you're dealing with and which are their needs and then try to focus on the solution which are able to uh, really support them uh, even if you have to move away from the fancy stuff which the big technology is uh, all about maybe you can find more effective uh, possibilities somewhere else it would be my my two cents as they say <laughs> Thank you very much for, for the input and thank you Fuk, also for the, the very important uh, question raised. Uh, before we move on to some final remarks from all our guest speakers, we would just like to pass the floor to Lana just to give a bit of a perspective from the youth partnership. Thank you, Alexandra. And yes, it's really interesting to hear all these uh, different reflections and uh, they always uh, kind of bring us, no matter what the topic, they bring us back to our research uh, and the work that we do uh, on, on this topic. And uh, uh, the question of uh, digitalization and social inclusion is something that we have been exploring for a couple of years now. And there are also some uh, very important and relevant findings, even from before the time of the pandemic, uh, when it comes to the inclusion inclusion of young people in the digital tools, the platforms, but also uh, the availability of different platforms, not only for young people, but also for youth workers and educators. Um, I think maybe just uh, one more thing to reflect on uh, this year is that, yes, we have uh, been kind of more exposed uh, to technology uh, because of the pandemic, uh, but we also have uh, seen a bit of uh, oversaturation of the use of digital tools. Uh, and I think that's why this point of, uh, uh, of Alicia that, uh, yes, we will have to call it something else because certainly we will continue uh, online, uh, but also as human beings, we do do crave uh, this face-to-face uh, -face contact and uh, uh, the question of social inclusion uh, in youth work uh, is as important in digital as well as in uh, in face-to-face -face format. So I think it gives us a lot of questions for uh, for discussion and a lot more questions for research uh, for us uh, within the youth partnership. So just briefly reflecting on that and uh, I pass uh, uh, I pass back to Alexandra to introduce our uh, visual. Yes, thank you very much, Lana, uh, for for this also important perspective. And uh, yes, as you were speaking, we could also see the great work that Renata is doing uh, with uh, with the graphic facilitation of of this uh, event. Uh, so you can see uh, now also on your screens um, the, the the images uh, and text produced. Uh, this this looks very interesting, and I and I think it's such a nice also. Uh, element to to add to this conversation and i think uh, some of the guest speakers also reflected before and also like this using these different tools uh in the work and different ways of of kind of communicating uh and 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 sending our point through so uh thank you also very much to uh renata uh for supporting uh visually this um this webinar uh okay so i think we are now uh ready to to move on to the very last part of our uh, webinar um, as we are approaching the end and we would like to ask all our guest speakers if you could make uh, a very short kind of final comment reflection or maybe just leave some food for thought for the rest of us in in a one two minutes uh, that would be uh, great so anyone that would like to start uh, please feel free 
I see some smiles. Uh, uh, it's, it's always the, the, the breaking of the ice. Maybe we can start with you, Ha, um, and, and hear your final remarks. Perfect. Um, yeah, it's really good that we're having this discussion from, from so many viewpoints. Um, I think we need to figure out really um, kind of what the damage is. Like, who, who did we reach during the pandemic and who did we leave behind? Because inevitably there are some, some kids that we, uh, we didn't reach uh, in the online world. And really to have that kind of discussion also within the field uh, with practitioners, policymakers, researchers, basically everyone involved and the young people, of course, as well, uh, to see what do we keep from all this? What did we learn and how do we use this motivation that practitioners hopefully now have uh, to also use digital tools more? I'm looking forward to that discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Yuha. Uh, it, we're we are all looking forward to 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 hopefully more more quality discussions on on this this topic. And I would now like to to then uh, ask Alicia for some final remarks. Uh, first of all, I just would like to say thank you for organizing this event. I I always learn a lot from other speakers and organizers. And today, I guess my final thoughts are. Um, you know, about the digital youth work, it seems to me that it's like an in-between space, you know, where um, young people cannot get any help from their schools when it comes to their digital needs, fears and aspirations, and they kind of might face the same challenges at home. So the digital youth work has become that space to deal with all of these issues without knowing how to do it. So uh, in my research previously, uh, some uh, a youth worker said that the, the youth workers have not had no choice but to actually become digital youth workers. Uh, and obviously there is lots of shame involved in not knowing enough, not doing enough. And what I witnessed during the pandemic is uh, an incredible amount of energy, resilience, creativity. And I think digital youth workers should you know, hear this over and over again, I think you're, you guys are amazing and the work that you're doing and the issues that you're dealing with. So I think we should allow ourselves for a little bit of like just vulnerability and, you know, uh, allowing ourselves to make those mistakes and, uh, and just to learn from one another instead of feeling that we're not good enough. So, so I would say this is my uh, final, final point. Uh, and thank you again for having me. Thank you very much, Alicia, and also for these encouraging uh, words for all the youth workers out there, uh, definitely showing uh, resilience and kind of learning on the go and, and doing their best to adapt to the situation. Um, great. So then I would suggest uh, we move on to Michele for some final remarks. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, of course, I'm adding myself to my colleagues saying thank you all for organizing this and for having us here, because this is the kind of conversation we should uh, have and keep on having. Uh, what I could add as a remark is the fact that we are discussing aspects that a few years ago were not even on the table. And here we are trying to discuss a possible strategy to, to tackle them and to uh, share research uh, about, about them and to talk about practices regarding them. So we are moving, we are moving towards it, we are trying to uh, cope with it. So my last remark would be uh, to be confident. Uh, I met a lot of youth workers in, in, in the last few years who, while I was working on exactly on training them on the digital youth work topic and so on. And many of them were scared because they didn't feel good enough. But as long as you are willing to learn, you are good enough. And I guess as humans, we all are <laughs> always learning. So we all are good enough. Uh, and, and we can learn from young people and young people can learn from us. And this is super interesting. And this is a space which is m more than ever in, in the digital youth work, uh, possible, uh, a possible expansion, a possible new uh, resource of uh, uh, learning experiences to be explored. So yeah, this is my point. We, we can make it and we have interesting spaces to explore while, make it, while making it. So let's, let's do it. I mean, we, we are doing it in fact. So let's, let's keep on.
Thank you, Michele, also for these uh, words of, of encouragement uh, that, I, that I think will kind of leave us all with, with kind of this new um, or, or, you know, this renewed enthusiasm um, for, for this, uh, this work and we're doing and, and, and this, this pertinent topic. And uh, I would now like to ask Sean for his final remarks as well and from, for this very youth perspective in this Perspectives on Youth. Thank you, Alexandra. It's, it's not easy speaking after three brilliant speakers and trying to conclude, but I will, I will do my best. Um, I want to, to thank you for, for curating the space once again. I, I believe that these are the kinds of conversations we need to be having. And as a young person, it's, again, I, I generally appreciate spaces like this because it's, it's definitely a key issue that we're going to be facing, that my generation will be facing in the future. And it's, exponentially going to be having more and more of an impact. I just want to say that uh, the, the nature of risk is not just a negative aspect, but it's the, a nature of uncertainty. And uncertain terms with regards to how events might pan out or might turn out. And levels of uncertainty have either potential negative results or potential positive results. And right now we're in a moment where we're in the middle of that uncertainty, where we're not really sure where we're going to go. And events like this, without a doubt, and conversations like this and, and channels of communication like this, definitely move the needle towards positive risk, towards opportunities, towards using these technologies to build a better future and a better tomorrow and stronger methods of participation and, and youth work rather than allowing these technologies to run unregulated and potentially cause harm um, to the divides that already exist. Um, so I, I want to thank you again for curating the space. I do believe this is an important topic for young people and it's, it's not going to go away. It's only going to become more and more fundamental, especially as the, the potential disruptiveness grows and, and yes, keeping young people at the table will only benefit the decisions we can make because they're also active users of, of these technologies and direct participants of it. And even though the ideas of, of young Gen Zers, as, as people like, like to call us sometimes, might seem a bit out of the box and might seem frightening when a young person comes to ask you to make a TikTok account or a Clubhouse account or all these new platforms that seem a bit new and different. Um, they are new methods of participation and sometimes embracing those ideas might open new doors in which we can communicate, educate each other, multiply ideas and overall have stronger levels of participation. So thank you again for the space and I'm really looking forward to see where, where these conversations develop. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to all the guest speakers for also making this space uh, together with us and making it meaningful with all your inputs. We have heard so many different um, angles to to this topic from you and uh we have talked about you know how technologies should serve our needs in digital youth work and how there are so many challenges in this digital divide but then how also we should use it in our favor in order to benefit the democratic process instead of creating this uh divide and also reflecting on the future of youth work and and digital youth work and how it will no longer even be called that because it will turn into something else and how the the kind of the good uh, even in spite of this in uncertainty and shame that you mentioned that goes around digital you know, youth work and youth workers, whether they're ready for it or not, uh, but how it also creates these opportunities for this culture cross-cultural experience and how we need to ensure that uh, we, we work with young people in a, in a safe uh, atmosphere and, and give them the voice. And uh, we heard also several times that na nature of participation is changing within this context of digital youth work. So we are also really excited uh, to, to continue this conversation and, and to see you know, what, what is going to, to come of it and, and how things are going to develop in the future. So before we uh, close uh, today's webinar, I would just like to pass the, the floor to Lana. Thank you, Alexandra. And I think just to keep on uh, with this uh, topic of continuing conversation, I would just like to use this opportunity to announce another event that we are having uh, next Tuesday uh, at 11, and that is the promotion and presentation on Youth Knowledge Book on Social Inclusion and Digitalization. So to bring back the topic uh, of inclusion and, and the digital world, uh, and we will be sharing it widely as well, and everybody is welcome to join. And I think the speakers we had today uh, will really 
really have a lot to contribute uh, to that uh, conversation and discussion as well. So this is uh, something to watch out for. Uh, so our conversation and dialogues continue uh, on this topic. Great, thank you very much, uh, Lana. So then from the side of Martina and I, we would like to once again, thank all the guest speakers for spending this morning with us and giving your precious inputs. We would like to thank uh, Renata for, for the incredible uh, job in the, in the graphic uh, facilitation uh, that will then also be available in the recording of this, um, uh, of this uh, webinar. And, uh, and of course, to um, to all of you uh, that have uh, joined us um, here this morning uh, and um, that are interested in this very important topic. And uh, thank you. Thank you for being with us uh, today. So then we would like to wish you um, a very pleasant uh, day and uh, hope to have the opportunity uh, to, to meet again and uh, talk about this or other relevant topics within perspectives on youth.